Well, welcome to our panel on, uh, call it the future of work and the impact of automation, especially on the nation of uh, India. But of course, uh, automation is uh, affecting uh, work around the world, not just in India, but India is especially pertinent because of the huge population and the large, very strong youth population all looking to find work and needing to find work. So we have a great panel today uh, from around the world. Uh, and I want to let each of them introduce themselves, but uh, the moon who's in uh, Toronto uh, and works on these issues a lot. Uh, Garish who's in Singapore and heads uh, Tata Consulting Asia and uh, knows these issues uh, not only from his own organization, but from uh, Tata Consulting, which is a huge organization around the world, but also from the clients that they consult to. And I'm a deep who uh, is uh, deeply involved in the fintech industry and the transition to cloud and all that that imports for automation. So it's a great cross section of uh, seeing this issue. So uh, I think to open things up, I'd like to suggest we um, walk around the uh, panel and have each panelist make a brief introduction of what they do and why this issue is important to them. And uh, Hamoon, I'd be glad to start with you. Thanks so much, Jerry, and uh, glad to be here as, as part of the panel. Um, and so as, as a quick bit of context, our work at Future Fit AI is very much day in, day out, focused on these questions and particularly the impacts on workers. So when you think about uh, the, the trends that AI is driving, so whether that is uh, more direct automation or more broad change in work and skills required for the future. When you think about, for example, some of the predictions by the World Economic Forum coming out of the Future Jobs Report, which we reported last year, over the next 10 years or so, you've got 95 million new jobs being created, but 80 million jobs being disrupted and changed or, or, or impacted. And while, so the question isn't whether or not there will be new jobs, the question is what will happen to the 80 million people who are in the jobs that will be impacted today? And so very much this question of what does the future of work look like, there's an element of how will work change? How will the workplace change? But fundamentally at the end of the day, and where we focus on what happens to the workers and how do we make, make sure all jobs are on what we focus on protecting, we do protect people as they go through these transitions. And excited to, to have the conversation with the group. Yeah. Great. And uh, Girish, uh, from your position uh, heading Tata Consulting in Asia, uh, briefly about your career and also about your view of uh, where we're headed. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, my um, I, this is my 26th year at the Tata Group. Um, I run a I run a fairly large business in terms of number of people around 50,000 plus people. Um, in in my in my group across Asia Pacific, um, but TCS today is a 500,000 employee organization. So we just we just crossed 500,000 associates in TCS, and uh, in most of the countries that we are in, uh, we are also recruiting, and we see a lot of demand um, across the world for tech talent. So I come from an industry where we are more um, supply constraint rather than demand constraint. Okay. Um, I also want to give you a quick view of uh, TCS. You know, TCS as an organization was actually just before the pandemic, we were 96% of our associates used to come to office every day around the world. And uh, we have completely transformed that within the span of 10 days after the pandemic hit us. Today, 97% of our associates around the world, which is around 500,000 people, work from the safety of their homes. So we've had a lot of learning as part of this. And we've put a position out there, Jerry, interesting, which is called 25 by 25. We believe that we will only need 25% of our associates come to office um, every week um, by the year 2025. Okay? And this has huge ramifications 
uh, not only for us, but for the whole industry as a whole. And I'll be glad to discuss this as we get along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Girish. And I'm Adi. Uh, hi. I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jerry and everyone. Uh, glad to be here in Horace's meeting again. Uh, to introduce myself, yes, I come from a tech background entirely, around 20 years. And last two years, my assignment is with the BEC, which is a a it's a multiple danish banks own own this it setup together and uh, our challenge is uh, upskilling the workforce uh, upskilling reskilling as well as technology migration a lot of change management uh, so i think i will discuss uh, my thoughts as we go further so that's my brief introduction yeah so uh, thank you both and uh, i'm pleased to have you so uh, in in my life uh, i had a, a role in the Pentagon and uh, recently did a study for the Pentagon on automation and its impact on the workforce, which we think could be quite dramatic. And it's interesting, it comes out in two, two different directions. One is uh, clearly reduction in the cost of operations and the reduction in labor costs, uh, then a transition of that workforce. But uh, secondly, the, uh, the benefits that can come from automation are quite enormous, uh, which is saw Google announced uh, Alpha Hold 2, where they're uh, unfolding proteins at an enormous rate. So the power of automation seems, and artificial intelligence seems pretty clear. Uh, so here we are in um, looking at India and, and talking about India. Uh, first question I would raise would be, do you think that... Uh, Automation, artificial intelligence is a opportunity for increased economic growth across the population, or is it uh, more the case that it'll be a concentration of uh, growth among the most highly educated and the wealthiest? So this takes us to sort of alternative scenarios. There's probably other scenarios, but it, what's your view? Is this portend good things for the future of India or tough things for the future of India. And I'd be glad to have, I'm sure each of you thought about it. Uh, maybe, Grish, start with you because of your breadth of who all you consult to. What's your view? How do we handle it? Yeah. Um, thank you, Jerry. I want to put some context with respect to India. Okay. So if you look at India per se today, um, India's economy has moved from an agrarian economy to a service-led economy. Okay? And we are today almost 60% of the job of, of the work that gets done in India are from the service sector. Okay? While employment today in the service sector is only 25%. Okay? So there is a there is a big gap out there. Okay? Today um, there is a lot of push from the Indian government on what we call make in India. And um, the manufacturing sector today in India only employs around 12% of the total labor force. Okay. And today we have almost 8 million people who join the workforce every year in India. Only around 30% of them are, are skilled. Okay. So there is a big skill gap um, which is out there in the market. Okay. Now, if you look at automation, you brought in automation. Okay, let me let me put the uh, the thing on what we do on automation because this is our day to day work. What we do. Okay, we strongly believe that um, whatever we are doing today, or within ourselves or for our clients, one third of that will be automated. So there is a there is a significant part of the work that we do for our customers which will get automated. Okay. But having said that, there is still going to be almost 4.3 million jobs which will be created in the tech sector. And, and today, as I said, as I started off, we are in a sector which is today, there is a supply constraint rather than demand constraint. Okay. And uh, when you look at the old world, I mean, there is a lot more of digitization going on and we are going to see a lot more of uh, supply constraint on that. Okay. Uh, the last one is that if manufacturing picks up and, and the government genuinely believes manufacturing has to pick up in India, 
it will create something like a hundred million new jobs in India. Okay. So the, there will be a net create, creation of jobs which will go up in India, okay. whether in spite of automation, there will be a lot of jobs which will get automated, but there will still be a lot more jobs in, available for people out there. Okay. And as we are seeing, we are going to we are seeing there are significant in India today. There are significant new areas which has come up. Okay. E-commerce is booming. Um, health as a sector is booming. Um, there is a lot more of um, new age companies coming up. And as we have seen just last just two days back, uh, another e-commerce company becoming a unicorn or, or touching a 10 billion valuation when they hit the IPO. So there is a lot more of digitization, which is going to give it a push as far as India is concerned. Okay. So I, for me, Jerry, I genuinely believe, believe India has the talent and India has the opportunity to actually look at how do, how do we fulfill these opportunities which are going to come up rather than getting worried about automation and people losing jobs. Good. So do you think, uh, let's stay with uh, manufacturing for a bit and I, I tap a moon in on this. Uh, w one of the uh, differences that uh, between China and India currently is that China has this really uh, intricate supply chain of manufacturing capacity. So they can go everywhere from the chip to the, the screw to the glass, the works. Uh, and they all fit together and they produce as in Foxconn, an iPhone, for instance. Uh, that's a big uh, skills set of skills needed, not only in the workers, but in the entrepreneurs that create those companies. So, I mean, what are you seeing in terms of uh, moving people into new skills and getting those skills? What's the positive, what's negative? No. I think, you know, as Grish was describing, the potential upside of what's coming is material and significant. Uh, I think the question on the other side of that coin then becomes, who's going to benefit from that potential upside? And how do we make sure that benefit is as widely shared as possible? So that one, and, and the, I, you know, in our work, we find the incredible uh, element about this question is actually, it's not about political philosophy. It's not about uh, which side of the, the aisle you sit on, because if, if you deeply believe that as businesses are going through transformation, they should be able to have the talent they need to drive the kind of vision they've got. To Grisha's point, that means there needs to be talent that's available, skilled and capable of actually doing doing the new work that's necessary. So when you think about even an industry like manufacturing, there was a time where you could you know, pull in a group of people and immediately have them start working on the shop floor because that that really is the presence is what was mostly needed. The rest would follow. Now, when you look at what a factory floor looks like, it is a very different, very different environment. The interaction people need to have with machines and then the ability to make judgment calls, micro judgment calls about is this machine doing this as close to the margin of error that is necessary? And if I need to make an adjustment to it, how do I make the call of how to use this little dashboard to do that all the way to literally cobots, so robots that are a colleague of yours that you are working in parallel in collaboration with. And, and so I think the, the, the implications of that are we have spent probably the last 100 years or so taking very much to this approach of just in case preparation of people from a skills and training perspective. We put them through 12 to 16 years of training just in case. We're going to put a bunch of content and knowledge into you just in case you're going to need it for the following 40 years of your life. And the reality is no longer that. What we need is very much just in time and context relevant uh, skills and, and, and learning and development. And then the second problem and challenge around developing the skills, whether companies need or the workforce needs or the government needs in its citizens, is that the majority of our investments in this space around reskilling, upskilling, and, and, and preparing people for the future. Imagine if you called a, a Grab, an Uber, if you called a, a cab to come to you, and the measure of success was you getting in the seat, and that's it. That was the measure of success, not you arriving at your destination. The problem with the majority of our workforce investments has been the measure has been how many people are in training seats. 
not about whether skills were actually acquired, not about whether they're actually necessarily ready for the new job or not, and not about whether or not they succeed. So arrival at destination needs to become the measure of success for corporate and public sector investments into workforce and skills development. And uh, I'm, I'm going to get to you in a second, but I want to ask uh, Hamoun, so um, what's your view of how well it's just almost immediately to the education system. Every time I talk about automation and workforce, it's skills. So how well is the system designing, developing, providing the skills that you say it gets you to the destination? Yeah, I think what, what's becoming interesting, and a lot of our work is framed around this long-term North Star of what does it look like to put a GPS for your career in the hands of everybody, right? No matter how you have it, where it comes from, but a GPS for your career. What's been interesting is we have traditionally said it's all on the education system. But as, as people like Grish and Emin and, and Deep in the work they're doing would tell you, it is actually increasingly a shared and necessarily shared responsibility. There is upside and benefit to every corporation and upside and benefit to every government. There's And, and so so it, you're increasingly seeing the, the, the employer, the government, the individual themselves and communities actively make these investments. And I think, Jerry, what has traditionally been uh, the, the model has been let the education system attempt to prepare everybody for everything, which has never been true. And now what we're shifting to and given, you know, that the, the, the experiences you've had over the years and the perspective you bring, Jerry, it's become very much about mission driven. For the next mission someone is going on, what are the skills and capabilities they need? And wherever they are, how do we come together to give them those skills? Partly supported by the corporation, partly supported by the government, perhaps if the individual can support it, partly supported by the individual as well. But much more about these micro missions and micro journeys rather than single preparation for the rest of their life, which would all sit on the education system and it's just not feasible. Anymore. Hey, Amandeep, um, so... Uh Talk a bit about what you're seeing, uh, especially as the fintech world gets very sophisticated and moving to the cloud. And I'm sure you're doing more than that. So what's your view of what we've just heard from Garish and uh, Hamoun? I, I think Girish took an uh, excellent example in the beginning and uh, Harun mentioned that uh, filling the seat, uh, filling the seat in the training, I think that was a pretty interesting one. So what we see is like, okay, we have signed up an e, uh, e-learning course provider and um, we went ahead and created a tech skills learning paths, role-based learning paths. And, and now, for example, we just see like, okay, who is signed up for this learning path? You know, like it's, it's a kind of stage of maturity then. But, but at least like w uh, doing this work was necessary first uh, that, okay, these are the roles. These are, ro these are role progression based on the skills that you get. And yes, you cannot hire people now, uh, just like the factory floor example, which uh, so, uh, you brought in, like, oh, you just come and start working from now. Look, you have to be trained for whatever needs to be coming. And... Um, Touching the previous point of the automation and all the threats, but uh, automation for quality, yes, we say operational efficiency, we we also say uh, incremental revenue, yes, also say, but also for the customer satisfaction. Uh, automation does play a role and it is uh, accepted uh, that it is required. But what most commonly uh, ignored is that automation also brings a lot of jobs, a lot of reskilling um, Forrester and other studies like they, they clearly mention that even with automation you cannot achieve the workforce productivity or customer satisfaction if you're not invested in upskilling reskilling your workforce so I, I think uh, they are the, the I just could compliment the other two panelists here yeah good so uh, back to what you're seeing Garish uh, with uh, companies we've now heard uh, Hamoun's a picture and uh, Amadeep's a green uh, a role for government, role for the company, role for the individual and the community. Uh, are you seeing companies investing more in skills, upskilling and where, where are you seeing the upskilling taking place? So I, I want to take a step back, especially contextified to India. So, Jerry, uh, if you talked about China and the fact that China has built a resilient supply chain, and that is the reason why they are able to produce products and, serve, uh, and goods. Okay. If you look at India, 
India still has a significant gap in vocational training. Okay. And if you want to create 100 million new jobs, there has to be institutions which we have to start uh, building and the government has to start building institutions which will quickly churn out uh, students um, who are able to do this manufacturing jobs. And these are not high end jobs. These might, some of them might be high end jobs. And for that, I think the government is taking steps, but I genuinely feel a lot more has to be done. We need to see what uh, what uh, Taiwan does, what uh, uh, China does, what uh, Germany does. Pick up the best from the world and start collaborating with those universities. Because the high-end jobs, for the high-end work, today India has created world-class institutions. Okay. But it's the second tier of manufacturing jobs for which we still need those institutions. Now, if that that particular and, and I genuinely believe there is an opportunity for a public private partnership in co-creating um, some of these institutions so that we are able to quickly churn out uh, people and who are able to build uh, skills for the future. And the government's job is also, for example, government is very keen on building semiconductor to India. But if you want to bring semiconductor or high-end manufacturing to places like India, you also need to create the infrastructure around it, which is not just availability of talent, but availability of natural resources, whether it is power, whether it is water, all the utilities and uninterrupted ones. Okay. This is also very important. Okay. And uh, that is another important aspect which the government has to ensure that predictability that has to happen then then comes the thing of about the people okay yes we all have an ownership to keep upgrading ourselves reskilling ourselves upskilling ourselves okay. so unless all the three sets of things come together which is governments businesses and individuals we will find ourselves in a place where we are not going to meet these numbers now, at the uh, Hamoud, I'd like to come back and hear briefly from you. What What do you think is the engine that motivates the kind of change that uh, Grish just described? I mean, you're you're right in this business, right? You're actually, if I understand you right, you're selling services in this business. Uh, talk a little bit about what you, what you're doing and what you think is needed in India to take it to the next level that you just heard Grish describe. Yeah, and, and perhaps as, as quick bit of context, our work is very much focused on the, the enabling technology, data, and, and AI side, side of things. And so we, we do partner with governments and corporations around upskilling, reskilling, redeployment of talent into, into new roles and future jobs. Uh, and I think what we found in, in that work, and that has crossed um, multiple continents, has been the driver becomes the most probably selfish needs that a stakeholder might have. Right. So in, in the case of corporations, when they are going through a period of growth, when it becomes clear that simply posting the post and pray approach to hiring is no longer going to work. Right. Because as as Grish described, it's a supply constraint side of issue. Uh, issue. It's not about the, the growth opportunities in there. It's about can we get enough talent, the right talent with the right skills at the right time to actually deliver against the opportunity. Examples we've seen is corporations saying, because that traditional hiring approach isn't giving us the outcomes we want anymore, we're actively going to go out into the market, invest in candidates up front before we've even hired them. Uh, you know, an example of a global company rolling out the, uh, plat the, uh, the platform in partnership with us, but in, in 12 countries where candidates get profiled unskilled, exposed to career pathways, their skill gap is immediately calculated, and the company is investing in them getting trained in advance of them ever getting hired, just so they're building a talent pool and a skill pool that they can draw on because of the projections they see. You've got an example of an IBM going all the way down to high school, building a six-year path 
all the way up to into a job where you're guaranteed a job on the other side by simply agreeing to go through this this uh, skilling program over six years as a high school student. And then maybe just to, two quick examples on the public sector side. And where, where Grish is saying sit, sitting, right? You've got this incredible example of not just talking about skills for the future, but the Singapore government building one of the deepest frameworks around understanding the needs of each indus industry, the pathways that are necessary to get there, the skills that might be required, and then investing 360 in the funding and the infrastructure to help people get there. Final example, government of France putting individualized credits in the hands of people to be able to say, this is for you to do ongoing reskilling and retraining. I think there are lots of questions about, are we doing it to the, at, the, at the right level, to the right depth? Uh, but maybe those are just some examples of where we see this come to life. Good. Yeah, I want to welcome uh, Shardul. And yes. uh, good to have you here. And we're uh, having a great discussion. And I'll bleed you into this in just a second. Uh, I want to stick just for a, a moment on uh, uh, the European perspective that uh, Amandeep must be seeing, which is a pretty activist government, pretty sophisticated government in terms of uh, uh, building the economy. Are, are there lessons, lessons that you see in uh, Europe that you think apply to uh, India? Uh, well, uh, that, uh, Europe has been very proactive on regulations and actually regulations uh, drive the technology adoption, as we call it. So, uh, so that, that is one thing. Uh, but the lessons uh, in terms of uh, reskilling, uh, keeping the workforce not like a pure hire and fire, as we say. Uh, I, I just take a simple, a simple example, like I think it was Capgemini or for some study, like if, if you have a 40 hour work week and uh, you're introducing certain automation that 10% of time of your worker or, or your staff is now available. So where the, as an organization, where you would like this 10% of uh, staff's time to go to in, in, in kind of preparing for the next role, learning, training and development, or you want to like uh, uh, do a new fresh contract of lesser work hours, or uh, you invest in that uh, individual, that uh, that staff, that how can he or she complement building new skills, or focus on higher value tasks which may be automated in future. So I think uh, this this is one additional perspective I just want to throw in, yeah. and let's continue. Yeah. yeah. The. Uh well, Shardul, uh, welcome. And uh, why don't you say a bit about uh, what you do and what brings you to this topic? And then uh, I'll uh, pose a question for uh, hopefully for you to answer specifically. So I'm the managing, uh, I'm the chairman executive of the firm of Shardul Amachan Mangaldas, which is one of the lead law firms of India. Uh, as a result, I do a lot of public policy work with the government of India and uh, I'm generally on several of the think tanks of the government of India and that is a uh, good enough reason to be on this call. <laughs> it certainly is. So tell me uh, from your perspective uh, advising the government we've been discussing uh, I, I think a, a view beginning to arise which is the supply of qualified talent to work with robots alongside automation is going to be the critical growth issues for India. There's clearly opportunity for the economy to grow. question is, how do we educate skill uh, a large number of young people to take, uh, Garish is saying, maybe 100 million more jobs in manufacturing as uh, make in India takes off. So what, what are you seeing at the top level of the government on those issues? See, currently there is not much scope of robotics or automation at the farmer level uh, as I see it, because they are more at the bottom, bottom half of the pyramid. Whereas for the manufacturing segment and the services segment, there is a lot of opportunity for robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning. And those are the areas where I see that government is bound to accelerate uh, its participation. India works on an incentive basis. So, uh, very early days when we started out on, uh, ventured out on the uh, 
the software bubble, as we call it, at that time, there were a lot of incentives given to the, the industry to really get themselves deeply entrenched in the question of software. And that is one way I see that the same principles which we followed in the context of robotics and automation, that you'll have to select the whole pyramid cannot be automated. The whole pyramid cannot be uh, cannot be really robotized. But segmentation wise, clearly manufacturing and the services segment are very amenable to both these processes. And if the incentives are given by the government of India to industry to really invest very heavily in this area, as also the government in, uh, government invests very heavily, then these two areas will definitely benefit. Whereas the farmer community for them to move into either manufacture or either into uh, services will take a lo lot more time. The, uh, so we're down to uh, about 10 minutes. So uh, I think I'd like to maybe flip the discussion briefly and say, is there something that I, we haven't posed yet that you really think we need to pay attention to? We've talked certainly about the impact of automation, the need for skills, uh, incentives in government. Is there something we haven't covered that you're hot to get on the table? And if not, I'm going to move to a second question, but I'm tapping into what you're thinking. Are you asking the question to me or to others generally? To all, all four of us, all four of you. But you're welcome to jump in first. I think uh, one of the issues that will have to be seen is the longer level, longer tenure thinking, which so far uh, has been more in dealing with population issues rather than expertise for population and upgradation of their skill set. So some of the new, new uh, sort of uh, new uh, ideas is, is really developing the school skill development. And there are universities which are now coming up for diversity and, uh, and entrepreneurship. And I think this is a movement which if it succeeds or if it picks up very, very well, then there will be a lot more attendance on the space of conversion of 400 million people, 400 million workers, on into the into the into the stream of more robotics and automation. So I see this as as one way of looking at it long term, rather than short term, where you want to just lower the labor costs and uh, you know uh, not really look invest in the long term. Thank you. You know I care about that issue, and in fact, in New York, I teamed up with. Michael Bloomberg when he was mayor to create a set of uh, incubators and to excite young people to do just what you're describing. It is enormously successful. We created uh, 375,000 new jobs in New York alone, uh, which on a population of 8 million is a good number of new jobs. So it's just what uh, Rich is talking about. You can, and young people are hungry to do that. That's my experience. So others... I have one. I have one. Um, you know, uh, we should also look at this in a post-COVID world. How will, how, what we have probably realized, um, there was a lot of urbanization which was happening around the world. Okay, if you look at pre-COVID, we were we had a movement towards urbanization. Okay. And we would have had at least 60% of the world's population moving to cities. Okay. What probably COVID has taught us is that there is another way of de-urbanizing and still getting work done. Okay. Yeah. So I want to bring in an element of what I call talent cloud. Okay. Just like we talk about cloud, um, I strongly believe the future of work is going to be that of talent clouds. Okay. Mm -hmm talent available on the cloud on demand and wherever it might be it might be in different parts of india it could be different parts of the world so to do that particular job where is the best talent available get everybody together to build that 
for for a for a particular client okay. and that is going to be the future and we have and we now have technology to enable it uh, jerry yes i agree and uh, would you agree linkedin is the beginning of that linkedin has uh, created the beginning of that talent cloud i think it could be much better but yes yeah no i think you know uh, what probably covid uh, i mean the others can speak about it as well i see four things coming out of covid okay and i call it uh, four c's okay the first thing which covid covid taught us is that we need to have communication established between different stakeholders okay so that's the first c okay as soon as you get your communication it is important to have then we realize that we need to have a collaboration just like we are collaborating with the one another on a platform like around the world we need to have a collaboration mechanism so people are able to speak to one another okay the third one is that if you want to collaborate in a, in a in an office setting you need to take all your assets and convert it into digital and the only way to do it is to put it onto the cloud okay and that is the third c which i call the cloud okay and the fourth one which is equally important is that more and more we are realizing that it is communication collaboration cloud is important but you also need cyber okay we all need to ensure that we have the the right cyber security frameworks so that our data is protected if you are able to get all the four c's together then i think you know the talent cloud will will work yeah good hamoon in thinking about your question jerry i think maybe a couple of quick uh Uh, call out on on related topics here one is around we talk a lot when we talk about the future of work about uniquely human skills right and, and i think uh, th- there's an interesting assumption underneath that which is a temporal and time based one uh, where we, we there is a need for us as a species to feel unique but there's also an element of over what time period do we think what skills are going to be unique if you think of overall set of human skills there are hard skills hand skills and head skills generally the three categories of them where automation first started are basic hand skills things that are predictable physical tasks it is now moving to unpredictable physical tasks it's moving to head skills so thinking calculation computation and we we generally treat hard skills as absolutely and uniquely human forever but if you look at where ai is going there are examples of where it is better than us at emotion read, reading emotions right it is better than us than listen at listening which some of us you know sometimes are, are don't do a great job of so i think we should be conscious of the temporal component of the, this this element of uniquely human so we can be responsive to it and then maybe just the, the second piece a quick call out is around the need to understand the personalization element of this you talked about young people and their aspirations and their dreams sometimes when we talk about the future of work we we assume as predetermined that because there are some growth jobs we should go and channel uh, every every new young person into those jobs without thinking about what are the experiences that could give them the most exposure even if they choose a path that is not necessarily immediately hi- high demand because that gives them life experience right how do we think about translation of skills between different areas someone coming back from military military service someone coming back from being on parental leave do there are skills that are being developed in those uniquely a lot unique life experiences that can be relevant to the workplace we just don't have a great translation engine today to 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 make that real and make that uh, valuable to to the economy yeah but that that's quite exciting because you're really creating a richer experience for uh, people's lives not just a work experience but, uh, Common deep yeah. we're uh, getting close yeah. to here so your turn yeah uh, i think um, um, most of the things are covered like uh, one is um, large organizations can do upskilling programs right understandable uh, what about small and medium enterprises yeah. so as um, harun took singapore example i could take uh, luxembourg example as well like it's it, like de- development of those uh, what we call the skill councils so the this skill councils like this is where the government inter- intervention or uh, private public intervention uh, is required to upskill the workers um, in smes sector specifically uh, somebody has to fill in the gap it maybe it's a university or maybe it's a like ibm or the microsofts of the world just taking over um, and uh, moving uh, moving the workforce in a different dimension 
and um, another thing was uh, uh, ILO in its uh, sanitary declaration 2019 mentioned that uh, uh, each organization to actually have a lifelong learning a learning and development department and in which i i think it is not restricted to just organizations but it's an overall society like you have to continuously skill and and reskill Uh, to be suitable for the job for uh, to be suitable for the future uh, automate enabled jobs uh, so there are some some questions on like how do we address that uh, as a tax incentive or uh, uh, learning should be uh, promoted or a mandatory learning and development because it's taking learning and development as a continuous uh, activity not just one training course sign up and start working forever the rest of your life uh that's not going to work out yes okay. Okay. this is good. I'm, i'm noticing the clock so we're down to uh uh three minutes so how about one last question which would be a uh a tough one which is uh, sort of the optimism pessimism question on uh, the future of workforce automation in india i re- i realize global's a bigger picture but let's focus on india uh So briefly are you optimistic or pessimistic and what uh for what reason and we're count down to about 2 minutes uh, I would put it, uh, India as an optimistic country because if you look at the kind of crisis we have overcome uh it, there's always a there's always a dawn after dusk and okay. I think there is a normal belief in even in the government that we can come out of any crisis except that we should not waste a crisis so that's the way i look at it that there is always a solution possible it's just that the government has got to be down to prioritizing its issues uh hamun i think if you look right across the world there is hardly a country that has as much potential in its talent oriented towards taking advantage of what's coming in the world from a, a demand perspective as as India so the potential is absolutely there i hope by corporations governments the right kind of investments are made so that young people in india end up being able to take advantage of the potential that's in front of them over over the coming decades to its to its full capacity and i think there is a gap to realize that potential to to reality um that hopefully will be filled good Gosh. No, I'm also very uh, very optimistic, uh, Jerry. I am optimistic because it's set, I mean, if I look at sector wise, okay, I strongly believe tech sector. Um, the we have found a way to tap the talent, and there is a very good infrastructure in the country to pick talent. Okay. If you look at the places where where we still need to go a significant distance, it is in the in the area of manufacturing where we strongly believe more skills has to be created and we also have a problem of getting women in the workforce we need to have more organized uh, women to come into the workforce these are two places which i want to call out here okay and i'm a deep you get the closing remarks Uh, i guess uh, most of it's already covered and uh, girish brought in the last point yes uh, inclusivity diversity uh, all all aspects of that course also has to be seen so who is moving along with this automation is it like a specific demographic specific gender what about the rest so in- ensuring that is also a remaining challenge and uh, uh, as i brought like uh, those skill councils or tech academy or for example the department that i am in what we call is bc tech academy Uh, Amazon has an example, Tech Academy. So these uh, Tech Academy, whether it's inside the company or as a at a social uh, kind of a skill council, uh, these uh, these academies also have this challenge to ensure uh, the workforce uh, diversity inclusivity is maintained, and uh, there there has to be a kind of overall uh, measurement around it, and how we are upskilling and how we are tackling it. Yes. Well, we've uh, used up our time. We've actually gone a little bit past it, but uh, uh, it's okay. It's a great discussion. I want to first compliment all four of you on the role you're playing in uh, leading the world to the and India to these new solutions. So that's a big plus. Two, a lot of great ideas, and 
I look forward to seeing uh, the progress we make, and I'm glad to be part of this challenge, and I enjoyed working with all of you. So have a great day and, uh, for Horasis and everyone. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Jerry. Thank, thank you for hosting, Jerry. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Bye.